I would like to say a few words about what can be done, what are some of the modest attempts that are being made. And in this particular case, in my case, by an initiative of the UN Secretary General, uh, taken on the proposals of the Prime Minister of Spain and Turkey a few years ago, uh, who saw that uh, we were indeed a few years after 9-11, probably in a public opinion perceptions that, well, there was probably a clash of civilizations because there were a number of uh, very ser serious terrorist attacks which had taken place in many places place of the world. And in a way, uh, the, a number of countries reacted. There was a perception that uh, you know, every single citizen, every single Muslim may have felt that they were part of the response to that, and, and, and unjustly. So, the attempt by the UN Secretary General was to launch an initiative which would try at building more inclusive societies in which the cultural and religious diversity can really be seen more as an asset than a problem and where the phenomenon of polarization could be addressed. The issues that we are discussing together, to, together today are much about perceptions, misperceptions uh, about ourselves and about the others. And what, what the Alliance is doing, but together with plenty of others, because what the Alliance is, is it is a platform that tries to bring together the best policy by institutional partners across the world, on the one hand, and the most innovative civil society initiatives, whether they come from grassroots association, from face-based -based initiatives, from corporation, uh, from the media sector, from wherever, the, the most innovative, the most promising policies and initiatives let's try to build together in order to improve the mutual perceptions and the, the conviction by everyone that they have their place in societies, equal, tre equal treatment in a, a society that respects, in fact, human rights, we will come back to this in a minute, and the rule of law for everyone. Important about perceptions of, of course, education. Uh, to a large extent, there is still a deficit in the way we have been educated. My generation, probably many of the younger generation are still being educated with a limited opening on the diversity of cultures and religions, including the, in particular, um, the different religion, the faith that they uh, can be exposed to almost on a daily basis. So developing a better awareness about that diversity and respect for that, an attitude, a positive attitude toward that diversity, while stressing the commonality between all of us all the time, that this is, this is a layer which builds on commonality is an important So some element. of the research I'll be sharing with you is actually based on a, a very recent study that we just released a couple days ago, uh, specifically tied to the title of the conference. And I'm, I'm going to take a little bit of a different spin. Uh, it, it does dovetail into the title of the gathering here, Incitement to Hatred and Violence on the Basis of Religion or Belief, but not uh, my, the focus of my comments will not be in the Islamophobia context, but in the more general context of public support throughout the world among Muslims and non-Muslims for attacks that specifically target civilians, whether they be perpetrated by a military or perpetrated by non-state actors, uh, as the legal world calls them, or, or just uh, what we would usually refer to as people who are not in the military, uh, whether it's an insurgent group, um, a terrorist group, there are all kinds of sort of cultural titles that we use for those groups. But empirical evidence and, and our research at Gallup paints a, a very different picture. Gallup research over the past several years suggests that one's religious identity and level of devotion have actually little to do with one's views on the moral acceptability of violently targeting civilians. Now, we found this to be largely true in many Muslim-majority countries, but also in many non-Muslim-majority countries as well. Now, in a recent study that we've conducted, it actually includes over 130 countries uh, around the globe. What we found are that human development and good governance 
not piety and culture, are the strongest factors in explaining differences in how publics across the world perceive the moral legitimacy of violent attacks targeting civilians. Needless to say, the implications of these findings on public policy, whether it be in Muslim majority countries or non-Muslim majority countries, particularly in places like the United States, are, are really far reaching. Uh, and our research suggests that to increase a public's rejection of targeting civilians, particularly in Muslim majority countries, leaders must focus far more on things like education, accountable governance, and less on religious ideology. Now, when I say that, I specifically mean government leaders, and hopefully in the discussion we'll talk about the role of religious leaders encountering uh, extremist ideologies. Now, we did this by asking uh, basically two questions, and we asked them in a way that required respondents to either absolutely reject attacks targeting civilians as never justified, or conditionally accepting the tactics as sometimes justified. This simplification in the question made it easier for us to compare across the 130 countries that we poll in because every survey that we do is conducted in local languages and translated back and forth. So we simplified the question to be able to really compare and not really lose anything in translation from society to society yes. or language. Some people language. think that for the military to target and kill civilians is sometimes justified, while others think that that kind of violence is never justified. Which is your opinion? Is it never justified, sometimes justified? Obviously, respondents can choose to say don't know or refuse. We asked, so as I mentioned earlier, what we found, in fact, is that the human development index scores of a country, the higher it is, the lower the rate is of people that say that attacks on civilians are morally justified, whether they be by a military or an individual group non-state actor. Therefore, in countries with lower UNDP Human Development Index scores, people are more likely to say that individual and military attacks on civilians are sometimes justified. Uh, this obviously suggests that human development is a strong policy lever that leaders should engage to lower the risk of social unrest rather than look to gerrymandering or fixing religious behavior, social norms, or theology. It's important to also note that the percentage of a nation's GDP that is devoted to education, and I, I found this fascinating, also correlates positively with lower public acceptance of individuals' uh, attacks on civilians or military attacks on civilians. So that component, the education component of human development uh, is also a crucial, crucial part. But in addition to human development, we also realized that there was a correlation between higher levels of public acceptance of attacks on civilians and social unrest and national instability. And we used a series of indices that are aimed to measure social unrest, social stability, political stability, um, they're, they're very clearly laid out in the report. And what we found is that countries that score higher on those indices tend to have a lower rate of respondents who specifically say that individual attacks on civilians uh, are justified. So the higher your score is on a series of those stability measures, the more likely you'll have a lower rate of people in your society that say that such attacks uh, are justified. Poor government accountability actually was another one of the major things that showed up. Uh, less transparency, less freedom. We use a Freedom House uh, index measure on sort of the general situation of freedom and rights in, in any given country in the world. All of these things, when countries score higher on them, we notice that they have lower levels of people in their public that say such attacks uh, are morally justified. Um, so there's a notion of Islamic exceptionalism. And it's not something positive. Don't get too excited. Uh, you know, since 9-11, we've heard these voices that Islam is particularly violent, or Islam Islam, when compared to other religions, has this added thing that encourages people to be more violent or to accept uh, acts like 9-11 as morally acceptable. Our data has actually not panned that out. What our data showed is that Muslim respondents, whether or not they say religion plays an important part of their life or not, don't really look any different when we compare whether or not they, they approve or disapprove of individual attacks on civilians. What we also did is compare countries or publics in OIC countries, Organization of Islamic Cooperation, to non-Muslim majority countries. And again, we actually found that members of OIC nations were actually less likely uh, than non-member OIC nation publics to support uh, individual attacks on uh, civilians or military attacks on civilians. So I want to again thank and a big round of applause to our great panel and Ottawan. Outstanding Ottawan. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. We have a very special presentation that we're going to do and um, uh, it's uh, it comes clear and brings very vividly 
the magnificence of life and how it's important for all of us to cherish life. We smile, we enjoy the laughter and loved ones, our brothers, our sisters, mothers, fathers, the laughter of a child. And I wanted to share with you this wonderful man here, Zitu Ibish, 25 of Clifton, New Jersey. On 9-11, September the 11th, a plane slammed into the first tower of the World Trade Center at 1,112 miles an hour, killing everybody instantly. And Zibu Ibish, uh, who works, he worked at the 103rd floor at Cantor Fitzgerald, and he called his wife and said, hey, honey, don't worry, I'm all right. I have to go now, the building's being evacuated. Nobody hears from Zibu Ibish after that phone call, but his wife, Layla, she waits hopefully after all, he whispered, hey, honey, I'll be home. Don't worry, I'll come. Indeed, the only Turkish citizen who lost his life that September the 11th, they were out there looking, searching, hoping, praying. Please, someone, someone call me. Let me know about my loved one. Left numbers like so many others that day. But this was the only Turkish citizen who lost his life on September the 11th when their remains were found. And so they searched, but in vain. And we remember the loved ones that were lost. In honor and memory of Zuhtu Ibish, a Turkish-American who lost his life on 9-11-2001 at the World Trade Center, we also salute all of those who lost their li lives and the loved ones in the tragedy of 9-11. Turkish-American community joins in the sorrow of the victims' families. Um, I just want to say, uh, I knew uh, the Ibish family. Uh, this was uh, one of the families that the trial lawyers cares we represented. Uh, and to see the sorrow of a family uh, firsthand um, is uh, very touching and very moving. Um, in that regard, I accept that I'm part of the family, and uh, I thank all of you uh, for the honor uh, of his life. Now with that, we have the voices of youth. How many of you all are in here? I'm not sure how many you can see, but how many are in the 16, 17? Can you raise your hand, 16 years old, 17 years old? Any? 19? You know, we forget. You are the leaders of America. You're the future leaders of this country. You become part of the tapestry. You are the tapestry of America. But 10 years ago, you all were six, seven years old, eight years old, nine years old. When the terrorist attacks happened, you didn't know what the heck was going on. You're looking for mom and dad. And uh, as the years passed, I know you've become much more aware of what took place on that day. And so what we'd like to do is hear from the stories and the aspirations of the future of these wonderful, wonderful kids.